Good morning, Chairman Nadler, Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. I'm honored to be here this morning. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Moline. I'm the chairperson of the Department of Occupational Medicine, Epidemiology, and Prevention at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University, Northwell. And I'm the, the director of the Northwell Queens World Trade Center Health Program. My specialty, occupational and environmental medicine, deals with the impact of hazardous substances on the health of individuals. On September 11th, I, like every person in New York, watched in shock and horror as our nation was attacked. My colleagues at Mount Sinai, where I was then working, knew of the potential for health effects related to asbestos and other toxicants. We knew there would be disease in the short term and the long term. Our immediate concern was for those acute health effects, the first wave. My colleagues and I have written extensive about this, extensively about this, and copies of some publications are attached to my testimony. At Mount Sinai, we began seeing patients that month. Through the tremendous efforts of the New York Congressional Delegation and Organized Labor, in April 2002, we were given one year of funding to begin medical surveillance programs for rescue and recovery workers, construction workers, and volunteers exposed at the pile. At the beginning, we could only evaluate patients and tell them their health conditions. We were not allowed to provide treatment. This program was extended one year, and we continued a partnership with SUNY Stony Brook, Queens College, New York University, and Rutgers to see patients in, con in locations convenient for them. These surveillance programs continued, eventually including treatment, and evolved into the World Trade Center Health Program authorized eventually by the James Adroga Act of 2010. After reauthorization in 2016, we had 75 years of funding for medical surveillance and care of World Trade Center related disorders, as well as dedicated research. As of March 31st, 2019, 95,320 first responders and survivors, the residents, school ch children, and individuals who worked in Lower Manhattan who returned to their businesses have been eva evaluated. Yes, the towers were in New York City and the Pentagon is here in DC, but it was an attack on our nation. And individuals from all over the country participated in this rescue and recovery effort. Over the past 18 years, some people have lived, have, who lived in the metro air, New York area have moved or retired to other parts of the country. Due to these reasons, there's a national component to the World Trade Center program. As of May 2019, 16,684 individuals are enrolled in the national program in every state. Downtown Manhattan, home to thousands of residents, was blanketed in thick dust. School children, like Lila sitting here, had been evacuated from their places of learning on September 11th. They returned to their schools despite fires that continued to rage and amid dust that persisted through May 2002. The survivors are also covered by the Zadroga Act, and the number of survivors has increased by 327% in eight years. Medical conditions have persisted, and that's the second wave. For example, over 50% of firefighters who worked at the World Trade Center site have developed a persistent respiratory condition. Rates of asthma remain elevated, along with a variety of other diseases. Here we are, nearly 20 years later, and unfortunately, <coughs> we've moved into the third wave of diseases, those conditions that take years to develop. We don't know a lot about the actual dust and fumes that envelop Lower Manhattan, but I'd like to reiterate that as medical professionals, we never believed the air was safe to breathe. That is now amply clear. The World Trade Center now collects additional data on diseases that have been classified as World Trade Center related. This is crucial since early data collection on who was exposed was lacking. Further research is ongoing to determine what new diseases might be added to the approved list. Since 2012, when over 50 cancers were added to the list of World Trade Center conditions, there have been 11,824 World Trade Center certified cancers treated, including 2,614 prostate, 552 lung, 741 breast, including over, 51, over 35 male breast cancers, 667 thyroid, 571 cases of lymphoma, and hundreds more. Gliomas Glioblastomas have occurred, like the one that killed Candidus Henry, a patient at the Northwell program. You will hear from his widow 
at, in this uh, session. The survivor program has had 3,030 individuals with cancer, and in the national program, the number of cancer cases certified increased from seven in 2013 to 708 in 2018. Nearly 20,000 children attended school below Houston Street and were exposed to over 150 toxicants in that deadly brew. Overall, over 55,000 people have cert been certified for at least one World Trade Center-related health condition in the responder and survivor programs and in the national programs. The effects from exposure of 9-11 have not only been measured in the number of deaths, cancers, lung transplants, and countless new cases of asthma. Studies have shown the impact on employment, disability, and early retirement. I'd like to briefly tell you about the impact by, hearing, by telling you about a real person. Ellie Engler, who's here today and has allowed me to give a brief description of her health issues, was a certified industrial hygiene, hygienist in charge of health and safety for the United Federation of Teachers. She went into every school in Lower Manhattan and assessed the immediate health risks for staff and children. In 2008, she developed a second breast cancer, a condition she had fought and beat in 1985. She developed asthma shortly after 9-11, but it was under control. Recently, she's had severe asthma attacks that have required hospital visits. Ellie, like so many in the World Trade Center community, fought these illnesses with courage. After 2011, she also realized that all 500 staff at these schools in Lower Manhattan were eligible for the health program if they had World Trade Center conditions, and she began staff outreach. She also advocates on, beha advocates on behalf of the school children in Lower Manhattan, who have now all graduated and moved throughout this country. Her clinical future, like so many others, is uncertain, and she will require close monitoring and care for the rest of her life. She is truly a hero. On September 11th, 2,973 people lost their lives, including firefighters, police officers, EMS workers, and people just going to work. Since then, an additional 204 police officers, 180 FDNY firefighters, and in total, an estimated 2,000 responders and survivors have died as a result of 9-11 illnesses. With every day, these numbers increase, and soon the day will come when there are more people who died of World Trade Center-related illnesses after 9-11 than perished on that horrible day. Based on the trends we have seen in research, this third wave of 9-11 diseases will continue. Because of the monitoring program, we're able to identify new clusters of disease that will develop, such as neurological conditions, autoimmune disorders, and diseases we can't foresee. I consider myself fortunate to have been in New York City on 9-11 so I could contribute to caring for the thousands of men and women who suffered from occupational and environmental exposures from the World Trade Center dust and fumes. Being able to serve my patients and our nation as a physician involved in the World Trade Center health programs is one of the greatest honors of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moline. Uh, Ms. Norris.